Hello, GQ. I'm Austin Butler, and here are my essentials. Hey, yeah, is this uh, GQ? Great. Yeah, so I was wondering um, if you guys maybe wanted to collaborate. KI7QCF. That's a ham radio call sign. Yeah, my my channel is basically just just Morse code. Hello. Hey, I am Forrest KI7QCF, and these are my CW essentials. So number one is definitely going to be the CW Way of Life by Chris Rakowski. This is a fantastic book. If CW has piqued your interest in the least, go purchase this book and just read the prelude. I guarantee if you read the prelude, you will want to read the rest of the book. It's an incredible story. It's a lot of great information. And uh, man, I just felt a really strong connection to Morse code uh, while reading this book. Number two is WinKey or USB. I get asked about this all the time, and it's what I recommend to all CW ops as when I was learning CW, I would use this paired with Iambic Master, a software program, to begin practicing sending Morse code. Obviously, getting on the air helped my sending the most, but WinKey or USB was a critical tool for practicing sending when I was trying to improve my speeds as well as proper spacing. Now, the WinKey or USB is also a critical tool for contesting. One of the funnest things you'll do as you get into CW is start to participate in contests, and the most widely used contesting software by far is N1MM. And this will interface with N1MM and allow you to use hotkeys from your computer when contesting. And guess what? The best CW ops in the world, they use hotkeys when contesting. So this is a great tool for contesting as well as for practicing sending Morse code. Number three is QRP radios, small five or 10 watt radios that are perfect for field operations. Field operations is really how I became aware of CW. And the small radios with how cool they are, how packable they are to summit mountains or to hop on a flight to Tokyo, Japan and keep it in your carry-on, these are the definition of cool. And I will always think that the coolest CW ops that I've met are guys that bring their radios with them on their incredible adventures. And QRP is extremely lightweight, it's extremely practical, it's convenient, and you'll be pretty surprised what you can do with five watts. Now in our community, it is pretty black and white. You see a lot of QRP guys that are QRP only, and a lot of QR QRO guys that are QRO only, and I think that's pretty silly. While I have a one kilowatt amp in my shack, and I understand the physics and science of how ham radio works, QRP for me will forever mean I like to bring CW with me and do it in some of the most remote and cool places out there. Now, if they made a QRP rig that was 1.5 kilowatts, I'd probably buy that too. I guess it wouldn't be a QRP rig at that point. What I mean is a small packable concealable radio that does 100 watts. That would be amazing. But as soon as you get to 20 watts, 30, 50, 100, you really start to go up in size and weight and QRP will always have a place. These small five watt radios, they're just so incredible. They're so feature packed, many of them, and they're pretty freaking cute. I mean, come on, you don't wanna have a bunch of small radios like this? Number four, QRO. And <laughs> this isn't QRO, but if you've been to my channel for the last year, I always refer to my 891 as QRO because unlike my five watt rigs, this rig does 100 watts. And for me, when I'm out operating or traveling, which I've taken this radio with me to Finland, Jamaica, and Maui, Hawaii, uh, I actually didn't take it with me to Tokyo, and I regretted that. But I like having the option to go 100 watts in the field because a lot of my operations uh, with my schedule, I'm looking to get in and out with a successful activation in as little as 10 minutes. Uh, I'll typically give myself closer to 20 or 30 minutes, but when I'm 100 watts with a good antenna, it's gonna increase my likelihood of making CW contacts. And the 891 at its price point, which I believe it's under $700, in my opinion, is one of the best values in all of amateur radio. I'm calling this uh, for a QRO, but in reality, it's more so about the 891. It's about having 100 watts. I don't care if it's a 7300 or some of those smaller rigs that people do take out into the field. The 891 for me, it's mounted permanently in my truck and I have a second one, again, that travels with me. 
Number five, my Vibroplex bugs, and I have a few. This is my birth year 1990 Vibroplex presentation model. It's a beautiful condition, gold bug, that has phenomenal action. But number five isn't so much about the Vibroplex bugs, for me as it is encouraging others to have manual keys. So whether it's a bug or a straight key, I really recommend every CW operator, even if it's once per year on straight key day, connect back to the roots of Morse code and use a manual key, whether that's a bug, a straight key, or a cootie. The vast majority of CW operators today are using paddles. They're using electronic gears, which is great. That's how I recommend people start, and I recommend people operate that way. I would actually say the majority of QSOs happening globally, when you consider the sheer amount of QSOs occurring within de-expeditions and contests, are actually happening via computers and hotkeys. I think we have an opportunity as a CW community to attempt to connect back to the roots of CW and Morse code via manual keys. I'm grateful I found a very strong personal connection to bugs. I just always loved the way they sound when I was activating and then when I began operating one I just fell even more in love. But I think whether it's a straight key or a cootie, connect to a manual key and use a manual key at least once in a while, even if it's once a year on straight key day. Number six, my solid state paddles from Croatia. I have the single lever and the dual lever. This is my original pink sock paddle. And uh, I always hated the way these looked. I didn't like the font as many people have commented. But man, if you have not used one of these paddles, you need to try it out. No mechanical adjustments, incredible feel, especially for QRQ operations. I really, really love these solid states. They might be my favorite Morse code paddles in my entire collection. And I love all my paddles. My Begali's are great, my March Magnetic, my N3ZN, my RA1 AOMs. But uh, I find myself going back to these quite a bit. And again, they're favorites in my collection. Number seven, my Palm radio paddles. I have three Palm radio paddles from Germany. When I got into the hobby, the widely known fact was Palm radio didn't exist anymore. And these were nostalgic, non-existent keys that you could only find on the secondhand market. That's no longer true, at least until recently. I don't know if that's changed, but DL9SCO on QRZ is still shipping these out brand new. I have the Palm Single, the Palm Pico, and the Palm Mini. And if you watch my videos, you see me use this all of the time. I run it from my 891. I love the injection molded plastic. I'm never gonna have an RF burn with one of these guys, which I've had with some of my other favorite field keys. And very durable and have lasted me a long time and just works so well. I love small field keys and my palm keys are probably my favorite. Number eight, my Elecraft AX3 antenna. I've gotta be honest with you guys, this antenna sucks. So why is it in my top 10? Well, about three weeks ago, I was ready to list this on QRZ and sell it. I've been taking it on sodas with me. I've brought it on multiple summits. I just got back from a week in Tokyo where this was the primary antenna that I used in activating 13 parks, two summits, making a few hundred CW QSOs. This antenna freaking sucks. I hate it, it's compromised, but it has a monopoly on one specific thing in that it is an extremely packable, concealable vertical that fits into this little tiny bag, and for travel and for soda, for what it weighs, this is, again, it just has a monopoly. There's, no, there's nothing else like this that I can band switch. So I have like six bands. Uh, obviously you see the 40 meter coil, which is what I use mostly in Tokyo. This is a compromised antenna. It's not great. You're much better served with a bigger vertical, like a Chelligan's MC750, a Radiotity HF009. Uh, or a wire antenna is astronomically better. But I tell you what, for what it's intended to do, uh, I am no longer interested in selling this. I will continue to keep this as part of my uh, field, field operations given its convenience, the fact that I could bring it on a carry-on, and it works, it just works. So I know I'm trashing it, I'm saying it's not good, it's not, but I'm no longer gonna sell it. I, I've just identified that it has a specific place in my field operations and in my travel and it has a really great feature set with changing bands. 
and uh, it'll it'll make QSOS for you. It'll get you activated. And here is the Elecraft AX3 packed up. It fits in my pocket. And don't forget that, especially when you're traveling, there's a time and a place where you need to have a really small footprint. On a Soda Summit that's heavily trafficked, I want to take up as little room as possible. At a Poda Park in downtown Tokyo with thousands of passerbys, where I'm not going to be putting a wire up in a tree. I'm not going to put up a huge vertical. This antenna has a place in field operations and there's nothing else quite like it. Number nine, an arborist throw line. I will forever be romantic about CW field operations because of Thomas K4SWL and his videos. And I'll never forget how I felt before I ever got on the air with CW, watching him break out a arborist throw line, spin it around and throw it up in a tree and then make QSOs off of a little wire. The Arborist throw line, uh, this is a little Weaver 8 ounce bag. Uh, this is always going to be a key part of my operations as I love wire antennas. I love that I could take you to specific poeta parks by my house. And I know based on how the canyon's oriented that if I do inverted V with an NFED half wave, I'm going to get my signal out of that canyon. And I just think it's so fun to use a throw line and get a wire up in a tree. So. I definitely can't live without my Arborist throw line. Number 10, it's going to be Ham2K Polo, the mobile application I use for my logging. I'd be remiss if I didn't mention Ham2K Polo. I've been using this application a little over a year and it's my favorite field logger. A few of the reasons I love this application is instant verification of the call sign that I log. I can see if the call sign is correct and if it matches their name and QTH. It also provides cool GPS functionality where I can see obviously where I'm located and all of my QSOs worldwide and color coded by band. I think probably the number one feature within Ham2K Polo and generally using digital loggers is the time you save by no longer manually entering your paper log. I can honestly say I've saved hours upon hours because the ADIF file is automatically generated and I simply import it into Poda or Soda. Number five. Number three is QRP radios. These are five or 10 watt radios that are super small in their package and perfect 